Hi there. Today we're going to talk about Gauss's law and electric fields. Now, electric fields are these strange new things. Uh, we're not used to thinking about fields. We're used to thinking about points and forces. Um, the electric field, we'll try to use an analogy with water flow to get a handle on it, but it's really kind of new and sophisticated, and Gauss's law is a strange new sophisticated sort of law. Uh, the reason for this sophistication is that Gauss's law will remain true unmodified when we move away from electrostatics and into electrodynamics with moving charges and magnetic fields. The more familiar Coulomb's law will stop working in that situation, so that's why we study it. Um, we're going to do a quick review of Coulomb's law and the electric field, and then we'll talk about electric flux, Gauss's law, and some example calculations. All right, enjoy. Coulomb's law is the first thing people learn about electricity and magnetism. Simply put, it says that the force between two point charges is proportional to the product of their charges divided by the distance between them squared. Our first task is to rewrite Coulomb's law using the electric field. The idea is to have a fixed source charge capital Q and put positive test charges little q nearby and see what the force looks like. The force has a direction which is along the line connecting the two charges, and the magnitude depends on Coulomb's law. We know that the magnitude of the force is always proportional to the test charge little q. The electric field is defined as the part of the force which does not depend on little q. The magnitude of the electric field is given by Coulomb's law without one of the charge factors, and the direction of the electric field is either away from or toward the charge that sources it, depending on the sign of that charge. The point of the electric field is that it's well defined even when the test charge little q is absent. So the electric field is a little arrow in space that represents the force that a positive test charge would have felt if it were there. In this example, since my source charge is positive, all the arrows point away. Often we will represent the electric field by electric field lines, which are just the arrows connected to each other. We know that the electric field is strongest right next to the source charge, and this is represented in the picture by a higher density of field lines. Away from the charge, the field lines are less dense, and this is where the field is weaker. Electrostatics is basically the study of the electric field created by fixed source charges. Let's study an example with both a positive and negative source charge. Right next to one of the two charges, the electric field looks as if the other charge were absent. To figure out what the electric field looks like at an arbitrary point in space, we ask what the force on a positive chest charge would be if it were placed there. After drawing several of the arrows, we're confident enough to connect them and draw the field line representation of the electric field. An important non-point charge example is an infinite plane with charge per area sigma. By symmetry, we know the electric field must point outward from the plane. We'll come back to this example later after discussing Gauss's law. Once you have an electric field, the quantity you're most interested in computing is the flux through a surface. Here's an electric field, but imagine instead that it was a picture of water flowing down a river. If I draw an imaginary surface in the middle, the amount of water which flows through that surface in some amount of time is called the flux through that surface, denoted by phi. We'll use that analogy to motivate the electric definition. Here's a surface of area A1 that's being pierced by the electric field. I want to keep track of the direction of the electric field through the surface, so I'm going to pick one normal of the surface and call that the positive one, here denoted by the red arrow. The electric flux through this surface is equal to the magnitude of the electric field times the area of the surface. The sign of the flux is determined by whether or not the electric field is going in the same direction as the normal. Here's another surface of area A2, which is oriented at an angle theta with respect to the original surface. Looking at the picture, we would see that the same amount of water flows through the first surface as the second surface, so their fluxes should be equal. Inserting a factor of cosine theta in the flux of surface number two accounts for the difference. We can write the definition for flux in an abbreviated way by assigning to each surface a vector. The magnitude of the vector is equal to the area of the surface, and the direction is the same as that of the normal. With those conventions, we see that the flux through the surface is easily written as the dot product of the electric field and the vector associated to the surface. What about the more general case of a not-so-uniform electric field and a funny-looking surface? 
The trick is to break the surface up into a bunch of tiny planes like we had before. Each of these planes has a normal vector. It's important that they all sort of agree on their direction. Here I'll point them all out. Each of those tiny planes has a small area dA and an associated vector as discussed before. The flux on a tiny plane is equal to the electric field at the point of the plane dotted into the vector dA. To get the flux for the whole surface, we just have to add up the flux through all the little planes. This is nothing more than the double integral over the surface. Now that we have the definition of electric flux, we can go on to compute some simple examples. Our first flux calculation example will be the flux through a little sphere of radius r surrounding a point charge q. We're going to compute the flux out of the sphere, which means that our little normals are going to point out in the radial direction. Since the electric field also points radially, we don't have to worry about any cosines in the dot product. The magnitude of the electric field is constant across the surface of the sphere, and is given by Coulomb's law. Finally, our surface integral reduces to the area of a sphere, 4 pi r squared. Thus we find that the flux out of the sphere is equal to q over epsilon naught. Now we're ready to state Gauss's law. Gauss's law is a statement about the electric flux out of an arbitrary closed surface. It's important first that the surface is closed, that is it has no boundary, and second that we're computing the flux out, that is the little normals point out of the surface. The law is simply that the electric flux is equal to the total charge enclosed divided by epsilon naught. Let's reverse our logic in the previous example and use Gauss's law to derive Coulomb's law. This time we'll start by saying that the electric flux is equal to q over epsilon naught. Symmetry lets us evaluate the dot product and pull the magnitude of the electric field out of the integral. Now we perform what's left of the service integral to get the area of the sphere, 4 pi r squared, and what we're left with is Coulomb's law staring us right in the face. From now on, we'll be thinking of Gauss's law as more fundamental, and Coulomb's law will be a consequence of Gauss's law. Now let's go back to a more qualitative discussion. This funny-shaped surface, which encloses the charge, has total electric flux equal to q over epsilon naught by Gauss's law. This other surface, which doesn't enclose the charge, has total flux equal to zero by Gauss's law. The funny thing is, if I change the surface on the right by just a little bit so that it no longer encloses the charge, it now also has zero flux. Let's discuss this in more detail using our water analogy in the case of both a positive and negative charge. I want you to think of this picture not as a picture of electric field, but as the picture of water flowing in a bathtub. Water enters the tub at this positive point, that's like the faucet. Water leaves the tub at the negative point. That's like the drain. The electric flux out of a closed surface is like the net amount of water passing outward through that surface. This surface surrounds neither the faucet nor the drain. That means the total amount of water entering inward through the surface is equal to the total amount of water exiting outward through the surface. Thus, the net flux through this surface is zero. Now I'll add a second surface which surrounds the faucet. Water which flows out of the faucet will eventually pass outward through the surface. The production of water in the interior of the surface leads to a net flux outward. A similar situation arises for the surface which surrounds the drain. Water which flows inward through this surface can exit through the drain, leading to a net inward flux, or a net negative outward flux. Finally, consider a surface which surrounds both the faucet and the drain. This surface combines the features of the other three. Now we see that if the faucet and the drain are equally powerful, the total flux through this surface will again be zero. Let's move back to a quantitative example, here with the infinite plane of charge per area sigma. We'll use Gauss's law on a surface which passes through the plane. This surface is a cylinder which is cut in half by the plane, and whose area on the top is equal to its area on the bottom. The total charge enclosed by this surface is equal to sigma times the total area enclosed by this surface. Naturally, this is the same as a top. We know that there's zero flux through the sides of the cylinder, and that the flux through the top is the same as that through the bottom by symmetry. So the total flux is equal to twice the flux through the top. The outward normal at the top is parallel to the electric field. 
so we can play the same game as before in evaluating the integral. When we solve for the electric field, we find the interesting result that it is independent of the distance h from the plane. As our final example, consider an infinite line of charge with charge per unit length, lambda. By symmetry, the electric field points away from the line. We're going to compute the electric flux through a cylinder of length L and radius R, which surrounds the line. The charge enclosed by the cylinder is equal to lambda times L, and evaluating this flux is very similar to the case of the plane. No flux passes through the ends of the cylinder, and by symmetry, we know that the flux through the side of the cylinder is equal to the magnitude of the electric field times the area of the side. Unrolling the cylinder, tells us that the area of the side is equal to pi times 2r times l. We find that the electric field magnitude goes like 1 over r. Did you get all that?